Uh, I'm Maren Lead. I'm a senior advisor here at the Center for Strategic International Studies, and uh, we are having this event this morning as part of our security dialogues and specifically a series of events focused on future rotorcraft, generously supported by Bell and Textron. We're very grateful to them for making uh, us able to do this more focused look at, at where rotorcraft is going. Um, We've had a couple of different events on future vertical lift, and this is the latest in that series. Um, we wanted to have a conversation about, as the FVL effort gets uh, more robust over time, what kinds of challenges and opportunities are out there? How does it take best advantage of the uh, plethora of lessons learned from past efforts, none of which are similar or identical to uh, what FBL is envisioned to become, but many of which have uh, salient experiences that might help guide the effort as it goes forward. So to that end, I'm really honored to be joined by a great panel here. <clears throat> First is my colleague and uh, mentor and uh, generally all-around smart guy, David Berto. He's the Senior Vice President and the Director of our National Security Program on Industry and Resources, also known as INSPIRE. Um, so leave it to David to figure out how to make industry and resources inspiring. Um, he's been at CSI since 2008. He has a long uh, career, both as an, an educator and as a practitioner in the Department of Defense in industry uh, as a professor, <coughs> excuse me, um, and is extremely knowledgeable about uh, acquisition and uh, in particular. So he's going to offer some thoughts on some work that his program has done in, uh, related to complex ac acquisition uh, and some of the historical lessons that they've been able to derive. Also, uh, Vice Admiral David Van Lett retired, um, was a naval aviator turned career acquisition professional who whose career culminated as the uh, program, ac program executive officer for uh, Joint Strike Fighter, and he, I think, is widely regarded as having taken over a, a program with some degree of uh, difficulty and challenge and making uh, pretty substantial changes in getting it back on track. So very honored and excited to have him here with us. Uh, Betsy Schmidt is the, uh, I got to get your title right, Betsy, sorry, I've, it, is it's the, long. it's long, it's, it's, she's the Vice President for National Security and Acquisition Policy at Aerospace Industries Association. Uh, before coming to AIA recently, Betsy spent 12 years on the Senate Defense Appropriations Committee uh, to include most recently as the staff director, or so the, the clerk. Um, and she's also has started her career as a presidential management fellow in the Department of Defense, served in multiple positions there. So she's uh, going to offer some thoughts on, in particular, some things that the FEL effort might want to keep in mind as it tries to work with the Congress, a challenge under any circumstances, I think most would argue. And finally, um, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Allison Thompson. Colonel Thompson is the Rotorcraft Special Military Assistant in the Office of the Secretary of Defense for Acquisition Technology and Logistics. Um, she is a, a Marine aviator who has com uh, commanded a squadron during a tour in Afghanistan, also uh, served for 13 months in an operational tour in multiple positions um, with Marine Air Group 29. Uh, she's had uh, both operational assignments and headquarters assignments, and is uh, sort of providing um, advice and insight to uh, ATNL uh, from from a variety of different perspectives going forward. So, um, I think she's going to provide some perspective on some things that they are potentially thinking about, and and try to ground uh, some of what could be. Uh, construed as either cautionary or uh, pessimistic <laughs> um, and, and talk about how they're going to try to take some of that on board. So a couple of admin notes to start. If people could turn off their ringers, that would be much appreciated. Uh, second, if for people who are watching on the web, if you'd 
like to send us questions by Twitter, you can do so at sec, CSIS SEC Dialogues. Um, and also, if you would prefer the old-fashioned way, you can email questions to me at mlead, M-L-E-E-D, at CSIS.org. Uh, and finally, when we get to the Q&A, if people could raise their hands, we'll come around with a mic. If you can be, first, identify yourself, and second, be concise, it would be greatly appreciated. So. Uh, with that, David, we'll start with you. And uh, again, David's going to offer some thoughts on some of the work that they've done about complex acquisitions in general. So. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Maren. Uh, I think I'm the only speaker with slides. So once, uh, once you're done with mine, uh, you'll be able to actually focus on, uh, on the discussion itself. Um, my group does a, a lot of research work. This particular project was under some funding uh, as part of the acquisition research program from the Naval Postgraduate School. We received the funding in 2012, and we completed the project uh, earlier this year and, and uh, had a fairly long, it's a kind of more academic study, an academic paper, uh, a long presentation and a long report posted on the MPS website. Uh, I think we'll have the slides here linked uh, to, to this website uh, and to the, to the presentation here after uh, it goes up this morning. So you'll be able to access the slides and, and download them. I'm really just going to summarize our, our work and give you a, a few of the examples that we found. Let me uh, go to, let's see, let me go to the next slide. I have to see out of the upper left-hand side of my head here. Um, we, we're looking at challenges and root causes. We've done a lot of work on managing complex systems. We put a book out about uh, five years ago. We've had a series of follow-on <coughs> projects. This particular one was looking at governance in the acquisition process for uh, systems of systems, mostly from a DOD perspective, entirely from a national security perspective. We had already developed a, a system of eight attributes that we use as a filtering mechanism for applying. I'm really sounding like an academic here, but, <laughs> but bear with me because there's relevance to it here, uh, that we apply to the governance uh, analysis process, if you will. And we put up a couple of definitions of complex systems and, and system systems simply because they mean different things to different people. Next slide. So the, the left-hand side here has the eight attributes, the level of organizational focus, decision-making authority, enforcement, which we include sort of in, in uh, quotation marks, auditing, meaning essentially internal oversight of the process, if you will, uh, integration of functional end-user needs all through the process, not just at the front end, knowledge ownership and sharing and access to knowledge, uh, workforce issues, the structure of incentives and the nature of the incentives, and finally, but not certainly least, uh, risk analysis, risk assessment, and risk mitigation. We did seven case studies. Two of them follow more of a traditional linear acquisition system process. We pick five that have more of an enterprise governance process underway. We're not going to go through the details of those today. Let me have the next slide. This is really uh, how we ended up focusing, and this is a very subjective slide. What you have across the top is the eight attributes down the left-hand side of the seven case studies. And we looked within each attribute for each of the cases, we essentially did a qualitative assessment of whether or not that program was performing at a relatively high level for each of those attributes, whether it was at a satisfactory level, an unsatisfactory level, or whether we couldn't find anything that they even cared about in that particular attribute, which we referred to as no significant uh, observations. This is a very generous uh, uh, assessment. I have a different version of this chart that's a very critical assessment. I, I don't use that uh, except internally because it discourages the hell out of people. So uh, rather than make this everybody is, this feel is like this is the time to give up, this is my optimist. This is the optimistic version of this chart. And we looked into each one of these and extracted from it for each of the eight attributes some critical or enabling observations, which were essentially our findings and conclusions. I'm going to go through those uh, pretty quickly with you. Um, let me go, go to the next slide. All that does is give you more background on the attributes. Let's skip that, go to the next one. So the first three of those eight attributes we found to be, as a result of our seven case studies, critical, highly important factors in best practices in governance. Some of these won't surprise you. Some of them are just kind of standard. You've heard every acquisition reform uh, uh, initiative in the last 30 years recommend these things. And so it falls in the category of these are such good ideas. Why are they so hard to do? But some of these were actually a bit surprising to me. Um, and keep in mind, we're looking here at systems of systems, where it's not just a pure linear program of record, but the potential of multiple systems interacting, which I think is exactly where future vertical lift will end up going here. Um, the first is a multi-layered level. 
at, in terms of the organizational focus. Focus at the program level, but with a strong emphasis on supplemented at enterprise level guidance and short authority chains to get to that enterprise level guidance. You may actually find this to be relevant from your experience as well. Um, the, the, at the enterprise level, a central governance body with oversight and enforcement powers. Uh, at the program level, um, uh, not only given the program manager authority over the program, but over the technology insertion and subsystem decisions. And this is particularly important in a systems of systems uh, approach. From a statutory uh, perspective, uh, we found, and, and this, uh, this document was published uh, just essentially, we were able to incorporate the November, late November 2013 version of DOD acquisition uh, in, in, um, Instruction, sorry, I keep calling it a directive, but it's now an instruction 5000.02. Um, and our, our interpretation of that correlated with our findings here, which is there's enough flexibility in the acquisition guidance documents to permit management the way it ought to be done. It doesn't dictate the process, if you will, um, but there needs to be an enterprise level authority that pays attention to the gate decisions, particularly as subsystems evolve and as needs change over time. And then some system specific enforcement mechanisms uh, with reporting requirements based on technological maturity and projected development schedules. Um, the idea of, of, uh, of information flowing up uh, as part of the oversight is critical to the process. We then looked at the other five. Let me have the next slide. I've got a couple of slides here on, on uh, the other five attributes and what we <coughs> determined to be enabling best practices, if you will. A strong focus on integrating functional user needs, not only early but often. What this really, I've got several charts that I left out of here, but what this really implies is an iterative cycle of requirements to contracts, to program, to, to development, um, and not freezing requirements, particularly when you've got integration across systems and systems. The ability to have flexibility in requirements, to incorporate end user needs, to incorporate developments of technology that were not anticipated at some element of the program is, is a very powerful factor involved. Sharing knowledge and knowledge access. Uh, all of you who have lived in this system know that uh, the first question you get asked if you ask for somebody to share their information is that what are you going to do with that? And until I know what you're going to do with it, I don't want to give it to you. Uh, and so what we, what we found a very strong focus is that those programs in our cases that had overcome that and had clear access by everybody to the information that was relevant to them, with also a recognition that not everybody has the same robust systems to allow them to see everything so that you accommodate those, uh, particularly field activities and end users that, that don't have access to all the same databases that you do, and it's still relevant to them, if you will. Workforce, um, strong uh, correlation between success in the programs and the ability to balance programmatic and technical workforce and to have enough people in place uh, in order to do the job. This is, of course, always a challenge in DOD and particularly in the, in the acquisition community and the technical side uh, with a pretty small oversight function so that uh, you don't encourage everybody who has a parochial interest has a representative in the oversight authority and they all have to have a say before anything gets decided. Uh, let me have the next one. This is really my last substantive chart, if you will. On the incentive structure, um, we found that successful programs had a very strong mission commitment, which required them to have a strong identification of what the mission was and a pretty good ability to uh, get people to be aware of and following that. And particularly for, for subsystems and components, uh, an ability to eliminate barriers to entry so that you could find and bring into play those contractors and developers who had something valuable to offer in that iterative cycle where you're updating requirements based on technology. Reducing the barriers to entry, not only the process barriers, but the cultural barriers to entry seem to be an element of success in those programs that did very well. And then finally, on risk assessment, we had three major findings of, from successful programs, uh, mitigating risks through better uh, systems integration and subsystem development. It's easy to say, very hard to do. Um, focusing on bringing in uh, more mature technologies and commercial off-the-shelf or nearly off-the-shelf technologies wherever possible as a risk mitigation. It has a high correlation of success in a number of these. And, and, uh, establishing, identifying, recognizing the less mature technologies and establishing very clear critical path tracking systems so that the minute that starts to threaten the execution of the program, you can bring those back into, into play, if you will. That's pretty much where we are. The last slide is our next steps. Um, we're always, the beauty of working in a think tank is we don't actually have to worry about follow-on work. Um, there's always follow-on work. There's always more questions to answer. There's always more research to be done. And, uh, and so we're still pursuing this uh, as well going forward. So thank you. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm.
you, you may have seen some evidence of the fact that I threatened them all to stay on a tight timeline in that very quick rundown. So uh, I appreciate you uh, adhering to my request in that regard, David. So it, it also was a requirement as I was putting this panel together that all of the male participants had to be named David. So um, the, <laughs> I'm now, Dave Lett, if you could please you. Uh, offer your, your thoughts on this. Thank you, Martin. The two previous CSIS panels on future vertical lift had the Department of Defense describe the why and to what they aspire and how they will pursue it. For why, they said it's an aging aircraft fleet. There's high operating and sustainment cost, capability gaps that exist, concern for the rotary wing industrial base health. What they need is <laughs> low cost manufacturing, lower operating and sustainment cost, and improved performance, faster, farther, and better systems capability. How they'll achieve it, model-based acquisition approach, open architectures, and a joint approach. So with those understandable needs and aspirations and a modern sounding approach, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Having a past association with complex acquisition programs, I could be reading Ecclesiastes 1.9 and there is nothing new under the sun. A notable point made several times by Dan Bailey, the Army Program Director, is the intent to gain from the Joint Multi-Role Technology Demonstration Project tools and competencies. Later, he explained tools and competencies for what? He said tools and competencies for the government workforce to be effective preventing requirements creep. Very good. But I wish he had added tools and competencies to enable an effective lead systems integration function. Tools and competencies that value fundamentals transparency, and realism. Dan expresses himself very well, and he knows his job, and he's very experienced. And if we met and talked a bit, I imagine he would agree that he meant to imply all of those. With that, Dan begins to strike my interest, because that is a focus on people and their actions and the decisions in performing their work of acquisition, both in government and industry. The hazard to overcome is the intersection of wanting to have it all, capabilities required in QDR, for example, colliding with this world of constrained resources. That collision creates desperate people under extreme pressure to find something new or believe something new will emerge that enables one to have it all for less. The pressure becomes extreme to the point of driving organizational behavior and leverage to conform and find reasons to support that belief. The battle banners that lead the charge are acquisition reform, innovation, rapid acquisition, and training an enlightened acquisition workforce that is less risk averse. It is the resulting unenlightened efforts in policy and process and associated leadership messaging that create an environment where people are prone and incentivized to depart from sound fundamentals, transparency, and realism. We have always lived in a world of constrained resources, both in our personal and professional lives, yet we still must produce results. That happens through the fundamental of optimization of the design and the constrained resources. To deliver a real result that is effective in the midst of all the constraints. Systems engineering emerged in the middle of the last century to perform that exact optimization function. The pressures from the collision create forces wanting to believe all that pesky systems engineering can be streamlined, that new models free us from unnecessary design reviews and expensive time-consuming testing. There will be little to no discovery or rework required. We can do it for less than the old-fashioned way. And the train departs the track of schedule and cost realism. And when a few old-fashioned voices point out concerns, the train departs the track of transparency to protect and defend an unreal schedule and budget. This is the complex acquisition development lesson learned for future vertical lift. Now, I clearly believe there is benefit from needed reform, innovation, and rapid acquisition. These can deliver better outcomes by keeping a sound grasp on fundamentals, transparency, and realism. The key is leadership creation of the environment that values them and motivates imitation and practice of them. 
the legislation, the organization, regulation, and process that are presently in place are a result of degraded trust from an extensive record of disappointing performance. But they are not causes, they are symptoms. Color of money, program manager tenure and incentives are not meaningful or effective cures. Leaders from acquisition executives, PEOs, systems command commanders, competency and warfare center leaders, program managers and all their counterparts in industry must raise a generation that more broadly holds to these traits. There are leaders that value and practice fundamentals, transparency and realism, and those who do not, you can tell. Those that do should be praised and promoted, and those that do not should be set aside or not confirmed or appointed. Again, in both government and industry, that is real and trains the generation coming up what to imitate and what to avoid. So I would promote the schedule and budget with margin for discovery and rework in the vein of realism. I would encourage the department to embrace independent design review chairs, independent schedule risk assessments and cost estimates, and only start the right programs. It's not a quick fix, and it is a long road. I look forward to your questions and our dialogue. Thanks. Um, Betsy is going to now talk a little bit about the congressional landscape. Um, and so I, I, Maren asked me to come on the panel to sort of put my old um, congressional SAC D hat on and, and talk about how I would look at this program through those lenses. Um, so thanks for inviting me here today. Um, and it's not often that I've been asked to comment on an, initi on an initiative while it's still in the very early stage of concept development. So I appreciate the opportunity to engage and possibly raise some red flags uh, that may need to be addressed early in, early in this stage of the, the process to help FBL get from paper to uh, reality. Um, and I'll confess up front that I've not had an opportunity to thoroughly review this program, or as I've been told, it's not a program, um, it's an initiative or a, a system of systems, um, which raises red flag number one for me. <laughs> um, initiatives tend to have a hard time going from a great series of concepts to programs of record. Uh, the strategy underlying them tends to be sound and thoughtful and hard to disagree with. Uh, the trouble is turning those grand ideas into production lines and, and platforms delivered to the warfighter, uh, which leads me to red flag number two. From the outset, there appears to be too many cooks in the kitchen here. Um, and if I understand it correctly, OSD and the Joint Staff are currently developing the requirements for this initiative. Um, and let me state from the outset, they commendably have the right goals and objectives in mind uh, to bring a significant increase in capability to the services. Uh, the trouble is, OSD and the Joint Staff um, don't have the capacity to manage programs, and they don't have the funds to manage programs, um, not to mention one as complex as, as FBL. So they need a service lead, uh, which leads me to red flag number three. It appears that the Army will be the executive agent, which absolutely makes sense since they're the largest user of vertical lift, um, but love them as I do for their service and sacrifice. It's no secret that the Army's had a difficult time um, uh, getting from acquisition concepts to, to programs delivered to the battlefield. Uh, so we need to make sure that they're committed to this early, that they have the capacity, the buy-in, and the budget um, to get this system of systems off the ground and uh, really need to, to keep that in mind going forward. Um, red flag number four, uh, be wary of taking on more than you can chew. Uh, the FBL concept includes four variants from light to ultra that intends to, um, to satisfy the requirements of every service. Um, and there's no one better suited to discuss the difficulty of combining multiple capable, uh, capabilities for multiple services into a single platform than Dave Van Lett, so I won't try to, try to um, uh, mimic his experience and his real on-the-ground experience with the Joint Strike Fighter program. Um, red flag number five, if I have the correct information, FBL is already in its fifth year of activity in DOD, uh, and the target timeline for IOC for the first variant, FBL medium, is 20 years away. That is a long time. Um, and, and one of the goals of FBL is to ensure the defense industrial base remains viable for vertical lift. A 20-year process to only hit IOC for one variant doesn't bode well for the success of launching this effort. Not only will the technology under consideration um, potentially be obsolete, the concept will likely change many times, leadership will change many times, 
Um, an industry may not have the incentive to stay in the game that duration without a substantial production program um, underway by that time period. Um, and lastly, uh, red flag number six, and that's just the budget reality. Uh, unless there's a substantial relief from the Budget Control Act uh, caps, or Congress accepts changes to, to military benefits, force structure, base closures, to make room for another major investment initiative, it's, challenge, it's challenging to see how this fits in the palm against other competing pressures. Um, I could go on with other concerns, but I'll end there. Um, I don't want to paint a dismal picture of failure. That's just not the case here. It's too early and important to put it on death row this soon. Uh, the capability has the potential to bring to the future, uh, to the future battlefield uh, true game-changing technology, um, just like the V-22 is today. And that was a program fraught with challenges and was nearly canceled on, on many occasions for those of you who lived that um, lengthy development program. Um, but it was vision, leadership, and, and quite frankly, um, sheer willpower that kept it alive during uh, some of its most precarious moments. So I look forward to answering questions. <laughs> well, um, so perhaps we should have started with pessimism and gone to optimism. We appear to have gone the other way. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, let me now uh, turn to you, Colonel, and, and uh, uh, put you in the position of having to, uh, to talk about, I, I assume, uh, perhaps incorrectly, that many of the red flags that Betsy raised are the are what drive your daily business. So um, if you could give us your perspective on A, to the extent to which you recognize those flags, uh, and B, how, it, from your perspective, you're attempting to m manage them. Sure, well, <clears throat> uh, thank you for this opportunity, too. I, I think this uh, whole dialogue is very, very important. And I'll kind of quickly, um, please keep me on time, uh, address these in, in first with the doctors and then Betsy and I'll end uh, addressing the Vice Admiral's uh, point. You know, I, I uh, hadn't seen, we hadn't been able to share some of uh, our comments, so you saw me fiercely taking notes up here, which is the point of this whole thing, uh, and, and it goes to the, the knowledge sharing and access to information. Uh, we can only get better by learning from mistakes that we've made in the past and things that we've done right. Uh, so as I looked at those uh, eight attributes, you know, I could quickly jot down how, how point by point we were going through and, and in construct setting up uh, things to mitigate those, those attributes. You know, level of focus, we have the executive steering group that Mr. Gonzalez uh, and General Thomas, who uh, opened up our first panel, talked about. Uh, and with that, um, and that pulls in industry and uh, all the services and folks within DOD that have uh, key stakeholders in that. And so that's our executive steering group. And then we have a council of colonels, again, made up of a subset of, of the services. Um, we're going to start bringing in the VL Seymour because that is uh, very the important. Vertical lift consortium. Thank you, vertical lift cons consortium, uh, so that we can partner with our, our industry uh, teammates on this because it is absolutely critical. Um, and then we have all the IPTs that, that Mr. Dan Bailey, uh, in, integrated planning teams that are looking at acquisition requirements, uh, commonality, and then the S&T piece that you've heard so much about with the, the joint multi-role tech demonstrator. So we certainly have a level of focus, um, but I can caveat that as well. Uh, it is a long time away. The integration of the user in need, certainly we did the uh, capabilities-based assessment, identified 55 capability <coughs> gaps. And that is the premise of which this whole, that is the foundation that all this is, is being built on. How do we address the warfighter needs? How do we um, make risk uh, mitigated mature technology, but still make it a leap ahead so that we can maintain that air dominance uh, and that battlefield edge? The enforcement, um, that I don't have anything for other than I think just budget and uh, <laughs> venues like this. And as we go along, just withstanding the test of time and all the all the hurdles that we ever will will kind of help enforce, keep us on track. Um, the uh, workforce, that is something that we certainly need to work through, possibly going to some kind of joint program office, uh, to your point, in the future. That certainly has been uh, uh, fraught with the difficulties in the past. We need to make sure that we have a good construct of that and, and uh, you know, make sure that we have belly buttons to push when there are issues, but then that we're bringing in uh, perspectives and viewpoints and knowledge from across DOD. Incentive that will go to the contracts 
how we write those, how we shape those, and making sure that uh, we do keep industry uh, in the fold and, and keep them engaged so that we can uh, keep that base stabilized and, uh, and also get good value for the taxpayer. The knowledge access, absolutely. I mean, we've got within the um, IPTs, they're going out across all the different um, types of programs, not just rotorcraft, not just vertical lift, not just uh, fixed wing aviation, but ground vehicles, communications, and, and, and trying to glean the lessons learned so that we can incorporate those and have a good program uh, with the best ideas that are out there. And then certainly for the risk, uh, we have the joint multi-role tech demonstrator. I mean, there's no other program that has that level of s and effort uh, prior to MDD, prior to AOA, prior to all these things when we really have to start putting hard money on the table, making tough decisions about what are our requirements. And, and sir, to your point, I, I understand the flexibility uh, of having requirements. You, you talked about requirement flexibility and how important that is. And <clears throat> Certainly we need to be adaptive, and, and that's where we get into the common uh, architecture, common interface, uh, commonality, so that you can, as things emerge, incorporate those on the main chassis, if you, if you will. But at some point, so that we avoid some of the mistakes of the past, I mean, the presidential helo had tremendous uh, requirements creep. I mean, you go through some of the Comanche, I mean, you go through some of these programs that are viewed as, as failed programs and you do get into requirements creep. So we are cognizant of kind of at some point snapping the chalk line on what are our, our key requirements that we need, what can we afford, and that is the whole you know, basis of what we're doing, making it affordable, and then allowing the, uh, the growth to incorporate things. So I think in fundamentally we have addressed those, but you know, to your point, absolutely, <laughs> the uh, proof will be in the pudding. And, and cooks in the kitchen and, and requirements. Uh, one thing I would say is, as you mentioned, the OSD and joint staff are, are defining requirements, and that's true as, as an oversight and, and speaking for DOD, that's what we do, but that is based on rigorous, rigorous um, uh, working teams for the requirements from the services and uh, you know, I mentioned those 55 requirements gaps. We highlighted those, what is common across all the services, what is common across different um, mission sets, and then what is specific to individual services, and those get lower priorities, you know, so that we, we can make sure we have that. Uh, and I already spoke to OSD and joint staff bandwidth. Yeah, that, that is something that we'll have to watch and, and make sure that we have funding. We're working on mechanisms so that services can help fund uh, joint things without losing control of their money because ultimately they are Title X, it is their money. Um, Army, absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I would <laughs> echo your point as a parochialism with the Marine Corps. Yeah, there, there has been, um, uh, you know, Army has a very strong fleet, it's a very large fleet, but there are definitely advantages to be gained by bringing in expertise in the other services. And so the commonality IPT is a Navy led. Uh, with NAVAIR, and we are working to make sure that we bring in, uh, you know, we're government, we talk about whole of government, we're trying to bring in whole of DOD, if you will, uh, to make sure it's successful. Uh, too big of a bite, yes. That is something that we also have put a lot of focus on, and that is something that we are very strenuously going through and trying to capture what should be program uh, of record one, I call it. What is that first thing? What is the size? What are the attributes? Uh, because we don't want to have one giant behemoth that we try to glom on all the requirements and gets way too expensive and can't lift its own weight. We don't need uh, you know, a fleet of 6,000 supersonic stealth helicopters. You know, it's just we're never gonna get there from here. So, um, but because it's a family of systems, we can spread load some of those requirements across to what makes the most sense. Uh, and then finally, the, the too long. Yes, it is a long time out. We're looking at possibly pulling it forward in a budget constrained environment, there's always that trade off and, and you know, Mr. Kendall spoke about that uh, the other day as far as where do we stop uh, investing? I mean, we'll always need to invest in legacy fleet, but where do we stop kind of um, incrementally improving the legacy fleet and make a clean uh, uh, step towards mature technology, but that gives us that advantage. And so I, I Bring it back to this this type of forum will keep the discussion going so that we can keep interest keep the dialogue going and sir to your point on the um, realism and transparency that we can bring this all together so that we
keep everyone going. Uh, MDD is 17. That in, in acquisition world is very, very close. So even though uh, we're looking at IOC a little ways out, when you look at the length of time that it typically takes for a clean sheet design rotorcraft, we're actually speeding that up. And we're doing that by not circumventing or accepting more risk, to your point, and Mr. Kendall spoke about, you know, there's a study that recently came out um, where if you go back at failed programs, you look at the budget environment in which they were uh, began, it's constrained environment, you accept more risk, and therefore you have more failed programs. So, so all the things that we're doing pre-MDD, JMR, uh, getting the technology right, defining our requirements, defining where we have the acquisition uh, trade space for affordability, uh, those things will allow us to even quicker get through to a program of record and field the fleet. So uh, I'll just end with, I appreciate this uh, forum, and, and we're taking notes because uh, it's early on, and all the good ideas that are out there we can incorporate and hopefully avoid uh, missteps in the future. Okay. Thanks very much for that. Uh, I, I apologize. One downside of having a large panel is that it takes a lot of time, but uh, all of these, I think, are really great, diverse perspectives. So I want to open it up to uh, the audience for the remainder of our time. If people could raise their hands, and they'll, again, come around with the mics, if you could identify yourselves quickly so if you can come up here. and. Sydney okay. Sydney Friedberg, BreakingDefense.com, hello. Uh, a, a question particularly for the Admiral, but I think everyone will have a perspective on this. It seems like, you know, to boil down this to a Hollywood high concept, the idea here is we want FVL to be the anti-JSF, to do avoid all the pitfalls of JSF. And there are some signs of that, like the fact that it's not going to be a single, you know, it's not going to be a single design with variants for all the services. It does seem to be like they're going to be a family of, of designs. But, you know, looking at the JSF as, you know, at this point a too big to fail program, but a program that's had many failures in it, uh, what are, you know, take some of these abstract principles, what are some of the specific things that went wrong on F-35 that we need to make sure to avoid on FVL? And are there signs that we're avoiding them or falling right back into them? Um, thank you, Sydney. Since you addressed me, I'll just briefly uh, say that uh, the differences between FVL and the uh, range of capabilities from super heavy, heavy to medium to scout level uh, are enough unlike F-35 that I'll not uh, make a direct comparison. I think. Uh, a way to get at what you're talking about would be not to have one umbrella program office and basket them all together, but to start separate programs when the funding's <laughs> ready. Those separate lines would be easier to defend and manage, and I think uh, have a better chance of success. I'd like to add one other thing to that. Um, unlike the Joint Strike Fighter, uh, future vertical lift can draw from and will draw from over the next couple of decades a very robust global commercial technology and industrial base um, at, at both the technical level and the capacity level. Uh, and I think in a, in a way offers opportunities, but also challenges because being able to, to both identify uh, those things that we'd like to go be able to, uh, to get and bring into DOD and then incorporate those into the requirements. Once you snap that chalk line, it has things in it that you didn't know you could put in it and they will become available. And you'll say, well, I don't have a requirement for that. Well, that's because you didn't know you could do it. Uh, you didn't know the global commercial world was moving in that direction. You also have access issues, not just by America and, and uh, access to global technology and who do we buy from, but particularly the commercial market tends to say, why exactly do I want to do business with the government? Do you have so many rules and regulations that I have to comply with that makes it hard for me to compete in my global commercial market? So uh, there's a host of challenges on that side, but I think a number of both technical and programmatic management opportunities that, uh, that you didn't have advantage, uh, the ability to go do. So. Yeah, and if I can just add from, from Warfighter perspective, uh, it, it in no way wants to be the complete uh, antonym of Joint Strike Fighter because uh, that technology and that capability will add a lot to our arsenal. So, uh, you know, even though there were many challenges and uh, high cost, it, it I think will be something that we'll be very happy that we have. 
Uh, Steve? Um, Sydney's question and Admiral Van Lett's answer practically anticipated my question, but I, I guess I will, I will persist nonetheless by, by observing that uh, I was in the Pentagon in 94, 95, 96 when this initiative with respect to the JSF was called JAST. And I'm telling you, this conversation is a, is a perfect transportation by 20 years of the conversation going on about then called JAST, Joint Advanced Strike Technology, which became the JSF program. And I just want to commend Admiral Van Lett's pretty forthright um, suggestion as to at least one of the antidotes um, uh, to have learned from uh, the Joint Strike Fighter program. I, uh, so here's the question. Um, have we overlearned jointness? Um, I think the original premise of jointness was that at least one of them, from an economic point of view, is that there were scale efficiencies to be had from, from jointness, either, either in terms of money and maybe in terms of operating effectiveness. And I, over time, particularly over the last 10 years, when scale efficiencies in the economy relative to technology are actually not that great, I wonder if, if we need to stop this catechism of jointness, and maybe this is the program, or the whatever we're calling this, the, the activity, uh, on which to stop and recognize that there were some limits to the values we could get out of jointness, and, and let's appreciate them. Can I jump in on that one right away? Because I, I get fairly passionate uh, about this, because I think there's so much to be gained, not just in pooling together resources and, and getting a increased capability. But when you look at, you know, they always talk tooth, tooth and tail, right? So yes, we want to increase our tooth, longer range, uh, uh, faster speed, all those types of things that are going to give us that edge on the battlefield. But the entire tail is uh, very constrained and very, very costly right now. When you look at, uh, you know, between 70 and 80 percent of life cycle uh, costs are after procurement. You're talking all the logistics trains. You're talking all the training, all the parts. Um, this is where joint commonality can give us so much and the flexibility on a battlefield, too, because if I'm flying a 53 and I have to divert uh, in the middle of Afghanistan or Iraq or wherever we are fighting uh, to an Army base, I am at best able to share a, a can of oil that I can put into my aircraft, not to mention parts. And, and now you, you think of all the, the huge iron mountains that we build, so to speak, of, of um, parts in theater. Jointness will give us flexibility and, and greatly reduce those costs when you look across the entire fleets. I'm sorry, but you have absolutely repeated and correctly. You've absolutely repeated and correctly the concept of value that we get from jointness. I would strongly, I would be interested in Admiral Van Lett and Betsy's remarks on this. I'd strongly recommend somebody go back and redo the sums. We all understand the concept, but I really wonder if the sums in practical application um, add up the way you, I understand, uh, feel convinced that they do. I, yeah, I would be curious uh, and yeah. very interested in how, in how that wasn't work because we would absolutely like to look at that. Yeah, and I, and I would just add, um, uh, the concepts are always, they're always brilliant. It's just how you carry them out. And I liked um, Dave and Lett's comment on, you know, possibly looking at this as several different program lines, setting this up so, okay, if the Army's going to develop the medium variant, then the, there's no reason that the other services can't just buy off the Army contract like they do with the Blackhawks now. Um, why not just perpetuate that as, as this program as goes forward? And having four separate programs with a little bit of less of the complexity, but, but work real hard to make sure that you've got that um, uh, parts and maintenance and, and all that built in, which is, is a challenge, but it, it's good to do. Um, I think that's a more a winning strategy, because it, it's just the, the joint working in the joint world is difficult. But if you've got, OK, Army, you're, you're going to do the medium lift. Um, Air Force, you're going to do the scout, or you know, whatever, it, whatever the mix ends up being. Um, then, then you force the other services just to buy off that multi-year contract. Hopefully, it'll get, it'll get to that stage and phase. I'll uh, put a different uh, aspect of jointness to, in my response and talk about at the level of the uh, execution of the acquisition process. I would strongly advocate and encourage that the, uh, the leaders um, one of the competencies that Dan aspires for should be a value of horizontal integration across 
the areas of the technical commands within all the services. That there should be a conviction and a commitment to those fundamentals, but there should be the proper blend of humility to know that they don't all exist at one place and that the Army would reach out to the Navy and to the Air Force uh, and to all of those places of expertise because in something as broad as the full range of uh, weight capability of vertical lift, there are specialties and issues that have developed from experience in all of those. So jointness in that aspect, that crosstalk, that mutual support at the acquisition level across the technical community should, uh, should be enhanced and not reduced. As a, as a think tank person, uh, I'm seized with the opportunity here for additional research. Um, <laughs> But more importantly, uh, Steve, I think that, that if you look at the question of joint from incorporating user needs and more and more variety of communities as part of that process, it's easy to conceive of a tipping point where adding an additional user actually creates a negative impact rather than a positive impact. And I don't think we have a good sense of that in DOD as we're assembling a program. The sense is, let's have everybody who can attach, attach to it, and we'll sort all those things out later. So better mechanisms for actually evaluating the, the, that that trade-off uh, wouldn't be a bad idea. I think from the, the point of view, the other aspect is clear from, from our research here that you can be as joint as you want, but you can't give the joint players unilateral veto power. There has got to be a program structure where there's a single decider of the trade space at, at every stage of the game here. And, uh, and that's where jointness ends and, and, and good governance and good acquisition management process begins. And I think what you're looking at is where is that point in the program and do we sometimes go too far in that direction? I think the answer is probably yes, but I, I do think this is a notion um, that really does need, need a lot more look. So. Um, Dave, if I could pull the thread a little bit on your comments about transparency and realism um, and some of the tensions that exist between those two, uh, and Betsy draw you into this as well, that um, being transparent about re the realities of your effort can sometimes put it at high risk, right? I mean, so, and, and in particular, uh, I think there's this challenge uh, sort of between the services and OSD, and then to some extent, or to a larger extent, potentially between uh, the Defense Department and the Congress, right? So can you, uh, expand upon that tension a little bit and how you think it is best managed because I think in practice that's a that's something people wrestle with over and over again uh, and and Betsy can you give your perspective on that as well I mean it's a, it's a sure. it's a lovely theory that is really hard to put into practice I think yeah Betsy uh, in the um, years of uh, <laughs> growing up in acquisition I had the opportunity to see both those who led with uh, valuing transparency and those who kept their information closer to the chest. And my observation of the impacts of both of those methods, I chose the transparency method. Um, a fully acknowledging the risks that come along with, with that. But uh, the, the point that's um, priceless is the trust that it builds. And uh, if you believe that you have nothing to hide, you should have nothing to fear with transparency. David, back to your comment, I, a title uh, I, I uh, like to use when I search around for that decision point is, who is the chief of good enough <laughs> when the constrained resources come to bear? And there are many of those chiefs. So they don't need to be recreated. They don't need to be created anew. Mm -hmm. They exist. They exist in the service chiefs. And, uh, and the secretaries at that level. And uh, when you get into the difficult discussions between operational test and acquisition, those are, those are healthy. They should uh, be embraced and welcomed, but then uh, there needs to be the chief of good enough to come in and, and move things along. Um, and, and I would agree with um, Dave. When he uh, took over the Joint Strike Fighter program, it was like a breath of fresh air, especially from my perspective. I think the first time that I, that I met him, I felt like, well, here's someone who's going to tell me what's going on in the program. And when he doesn't know an answer to a question, he would go back and, and, and look it up, because he might have wanted to know the answer to the question himself. And um, it, it really built a, a tighter relationship. And, and um, from the congressional side, uh, you always feel like the department is hiding the ball. 
Um, they don't want to tell you everything. And I'll tell you, that's, that's probably the, the um, worst way to run a program. Uh, you, want, you want the professional staff, you want the members to have buy-in, you want them to be in at the front, you want them to be your partners in an effort versus trying to set up something that's more adversarial because they'll take your money, they'll slow down your program, they'll do, they'll, they'll do things that, that may unnecessarily penalize a program going forward and not, not to be spiteful, but because they genuinely don't understand or they don't have the, the trust and confidence that you can pull it off. So they'll want to see gates, they'll want to see, um, you know, maybe we'll draw, draw some money uh, back to make sure you're progressing in, in, a, in a manner that, that's good. Um, and when I looked at the, the House and Senate marks on um, the, the FBL program, um, it kind of alerted me to the fact that I'm not sure the FBL program has had an open dialogue with the Congress yet. Um, the House marked the program, the MHXX lines in the Navy, um, and said ahead of need, which to me sort of raised uh, an issue that they, they might not understand the concept or they don't think you can execute the money in time, but a dialogue needs to, to take place sooner than later. Um, and then the Senate added money for uh, the, the consortium, um, but also moved money from uh, a larger Navy helo line into the MHXX program line, which indicates they want visibility into the program. Um, the justification materials that accompanied the request didn't talk about this effort. Um, so already there's probably a little bit of tension going, you know, what, what are you guys doing over there? Can you include us? Talk to us. Uh, we want to see this program and, and um, see, see how, you know, whether it's viable and, and what the path forward is. Yeah, and, and uh, Betsy was kind enough to take some time with me a couple days ago to talk through that and uh, get a list of who to go visit on the Hill. And, and that, that I think absolutely that's something that uh, has been missing as we internally try to sort out mm -hmm. uh, the best way to go forward and get all the different uh, mechanisms in place. So uh, um, I know General Thomas and uh, Mr. Gonzalez and, and probably uh, others will be engaging with the Hill to, for that very point. Are there audience questions? I'm Mike Miller with Bell Helicopter. Uh, Admiral Van Lett, you've been doing this a long time. What is your message to industry on such a complex undertaking, the FEL? Mike, you're kind and uh, TPS classmate. Thanks for being here today. Good to see you, friend. Um, it's the same as uh, it, my, my points are equal to industry as they are to government. The realism, the fundamentals uh, need to be applied there. The search for leaders who value those need to be applied equally in industry um, as they do in, in the government. Major General Giovanni Fantuzzi, I'm the Italian Defense Attaché. If you allow me, I would like to bring the discussion a little bit on the international perspective. Uh, if we compare JSF uh, to FBL, we are missing a big piece within, you know, the international participation. Uh, on uh, strategic documents of DOD, we are hearing and reading, uh, the last one is the QDR, a strong uh, advocacy to cooperation, to open, uh, to a burden sharing, to more, to get especially, you know, NATO countries more involved. Uh, may I ask to the panel uh, why FBL is missing uh, the partner participation in the uh, program office uh, and in the sharing of the development of the program, but also is missing the European industry as a whole. Uh, that I think is not, in my personal opinion, probably the best way to, to manage such a, a, an endeavor. Thanks. Over to you. Yeah, I, I can jump in. Um, it, to your point, sir, I, the thing is right now we're, we're not a program, as you keep saying, so we're still in that very early development. And so, and we've looked into this <clears throat> um, just recently, and we certainly welcome uh, international partners to, to get with the joint staff on the requirements piece as we develop through that. But since we don't have a program yet, there, there's really no acquisition piece to start engaging uh, necessarily with uh, uh, European industry and whatnot, but uh, that is, in its infancy as far as really frankly us just 
thinking outside of just trying to sort through all the requirements and get through the, the technology maturity uh, in the S&T realm. So it's something that I think we will grow in the future and, uh, and something that we need to put more consideration into and figure out the best way to uh, possibly include joint participation internationally. Could I, could I add something to that? Uh, some of the work we've done at CSIS looking at, at uh, international cooperation and, and, and programs, uh, I kind of hate the word burden sharing because it sounds like somebody's carrying more than their share of the load, which is never what it really is aimed to be, so, but I don't have a better, better word for it. Um, and, and while we haven't looked at it specifically from the, uh, the rotorcraft uh, industry point of view, uh, a couple of our findings were that if you wait for government-to-government -government agreements to get in place, they take a long time. There's a lot you can do, and back to the question that Mike asked, uh, asked you, sir, about industry, what can industry do? There's a lot you can do at the industry-to-industry -industry level across international lines, particularly in an industry like this where there is a very powerful global uh, dynamic. And, and if I were industry, I wouldn't wait for the demand signals to materialize from DOD. I would recognize that sooner or later there is a volume of demand DOD is going to have to come up with. We don't have an alternative to rotary lift for the foreseeable future in, 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 in our lifetimes. And so there's a lot of opportunity for industry to industry with appropriate government watching, if you will, but not necessarily wait for government commitments. And I would urge industry to be thinking about those sort of things and looking for that now. Yeah, very good. Giovanni, first, thank you for bringing up that point. I agree with you that that has uh, been missing and would be a great add to this whole dialogue. But I would point out that the value gained from the relationships uh, that are, uh, can be cemented across industry and MOD boundaries are, are tremendously valuable and powerful and would bring great benefit in all the aspects of uh, coalition work um, going forward. So thank you for bringing that up. I agree with you. Okay. I think we have time for one more question. We'll go right there. <coughs> Hi, uh, Roman Schweitzer from Guggenheim Securities, and since I'm the uh, last guy, I'll take the question that uh, the obvious one that everyone wants to avoid. But I'm curious as to why, as the Army is the lead and looking to fill the medium lift role, is going to wait 25 years to buy an aircraft that the Marine Corps is flying, the Air Force is flying, the Navy is considering for its COD mission. We have two international partners. Uh, I would say that FVL may have disincentivized the current team from looking at upgrades, but. As Admiral Van Lett knows, we took the Hornet and created the Super Hornet. And so I just wonder that over the next two decades, if we're going to arrive back to where we started from after a very painful development program with V-22. Thank you. Actually, I guess I would just say, will the V-22 be considered an AOA, and how is it a uh, shortfall in the 55 uh, capability gaps? Yeah, right now, uh, it we're still scoping that all out to, as I mentioned, the family of systems, what, what is appropriate uh, chassis basically for uh, and propulsion system <clears throat> uh, for program of record one. When you look at first to need across DOD, you're looking something uh, a little smaller than a V-22, uh, you know, and it, we're, we're stressing it's not a one-for-one -one replacement, but Black Hawk Apache, um, you, Navy has the Romeo and Sierras, Marine Corps has the H-1s, uh, that they are currently upgrading but will probably be first to need. I think the Marine Corps is committed to doing upgrades down the line for V-22. It's been, as you point out, a very, very successful program. Um, so you need escorts for that, right? And looking at uh, General Davis, the new uh, uh, Deputy Commandant of Aviation spoke last night, They're looking at putting um, fuel tanks in the back of a V-22 and being able to aerial refuel uh, jets. And then hopefully FVL next, maybe. And I, I look at uh, FVL as kind of democratizing V-22, right? Because V-22 uh, is a phenomenal platform, has phenomenal capability, and is the most in-demand platform in the Marine Corps right now by the combatant commanders because of that ability to get wherever you need quickly, fastly, and, and land without a runway. Um, so when you bring that, though, it, it, it in, in you know, I mean, we're talking Bell Helicopter, that's uh, their, um, uh, you know, their designs, moving that forward and making it even a better mousetrap, getting it more affordable, 
making it, uh, scaling it to the right size to meet different requirements and then having it complement, in this case, because that, that was the question, V-22 for the Marine Corps, uh, but then just bringing those types of capability sets to the other services as well uh, as, as their needs and requirements uh, dictate those, because not everyone needs exactly what V-22 brings. Okay, uh, let me say thanks to all of you very much for a very rich and diverse conversation. I'm sure it will continue. Thank you all for taking the time for coming and we hope you come to our next FBL focused event. Thanks. Thank